Hello and welcome to Written in Uncertainty, an Elder Scrolls podcast sat firmly in the grey maybe of Tamriel. My name is Arimithius, and today I'm discussing a concept that echoes throughout much of the Elder Scrolls lore, a repeating narrative pattern that seems to hold a degree of mystical power within the Elder Scrolls universe, one that dethrones kings, empowers rebels, and maims onlookers. Today we're asking, what is an enantiomorph? Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone that this is my own understanding of the idea and not necessarily the whole truth of the matter, although I will do my best to bring in other viewpoints as well. You may have other ideas, and if so, I would absolutely love to hear them. Please leave a comment wherever you're listening and I will try and get back to you. Also, I will be linking the sources that I quote in this podcast in the blog post that's going alongside this at writteninuncertainty.wordpress.com. So please go there, check the sources and go through them yourself rather than just taking what I say at face value. I'd also note that the Selectives Lawcast has an absolutely awesome discussion of the Enantiomorph. So if you have just over an hour to spare, go away and watch that one. Now, go on, shoot. However, if you want things to be a bit more bite-sized, I'll do what I can here. First of all, a bit of real-world stuff. In the real world, an enantiomorph is a pair of mirrored opposites or chiral opposites. It's a term most often used in geology and chemistry to describe rock or molecule foundations. When you hear talk about handedness in molecules like left-handed or right-handed molecules that's what it's talking about there's an enantiomorph double going on there the key is that the things are the same but different like right and left hands but i don't think that and the right and left hands are technically described as an enantiomorph anywhere but that is the kind of opposite an enantiomorph is right and left hands are definitely chiral opposites In the Elder Scrolls, the term itself only really comes up in a handful of texts and generally as a word to describe Xurin Arctus and Talos, and that's definitely the case in Skeleton Man's interview with the denizens of Tamriel, and it's also a name for Sermon 2 in the 36 Lessons of Vivek. We also have this comment from Michael Kirkbride that was posted, I believe, at some point either just before or during the Amaranth Hunt in 2012-2013 on the Bethesda forums. The comment is this. As far as the Anuad, Nern, female slash land slash freedom catalyst for the birth death of an antimorph slash Anu Padme, an antimorph with requisite betrayal, witnessing shield Thane who goes blind or is maimed and thus solidifies the waveform, blind maimed equals final decision. Here, Anu and Padme are identified as the enantiomorph and are a conflict which is resolved. We start to get the elements of the enantiomorph from this and a few other bits as well. In particular, we have the witness who solidifies the waveform, so to speak, resolving the conflict. The law community tends to discuss the enantiomorph in terms of rebel, king and observer or witness, although not all of these are necessarily present and there may be other elements depending on who you ask. One that is very present in that quote is the catalyst, which is, so far as I can tell, the thing that starts the conflict between the rebel and the king. Some place quite a bit of stock in the catalyst. I personally don't because it can't always be identified, so I don't think it's vital to the process. In addition to the usage of Rebel, King and Observer, we can also link them to the archetypes of Thief, Warrior and Mage that are present in many fantasy genres. However, for clarity's sake, I'll be talking in terms of Rebel, King and Observer for this cast. The basic structure is that the Rebel defeats the King, aided by the Observer, who chooses a victor. For many enantiomorphs, the rebel and the king are difficult to tell apart. The observer in effect chooses the victor in the conflict between rebel and king, giving one the status of victorious rebel and the other that of defeated king. Vivek sums this up really well in Sermon 11 of the 36 Lessons. In it we have a lot of talk about ruling kings, most particularly this quote. The ruling king that sees in another his equivalent rules nothing. The secret of weapons is this, they are the mercy seat. The secret of language is this, it is immobile. The ruling king is armoured head to toe in brilliant flame. He is redeemed by each act he undertakes. His death is only a diagram back to the waking world. He sleeps the second way. The shamat is his double, and therefore you wonder if you rule nothing. 
Hortator and Charmat, one and one, eleven, an inelegant number. Which of the ones is the more important? Could you ever tell if they switch places? I can, and that's why you need me. The start and end of that section are the important bits. We have the Hortator, the Nereverine, who is the player character in The Elder Scrolls III, and the Sharmat, Dagoth Ur, being the Rebel and the King respectively. Vivek is casting herself as the Observer, the one who chooses between them. To sum up what's gone before, in case I rambled a bit, the Enantiomorph has a rebel and a king who are the key elements of the Enantiomorph. We also have an observer who chooses which is which and is often maimed as a result of the conflict. We may also have a catalyst which starts the reaction. Another key element here is that the rebel and the king are hard to tell apart, that they could be either until the observer makes their final decision. Now that we have that framework, we can look at the various times that these appear in the Elder Scrolls games without necessarily being named. I'm only going to go through those that I definitely think are enantiomorphs in the fullest sense of the word, because if you make it really basic, it can be applied to almost anything and then becomes a little meaningless. The first example that we have is Anu and Padme. We have the two brothers fighting over Nier, who chooses Anu, and Anu then defeats Padme, and Nier is later killed by Padme. In the first Anantiomorph, I place Padme as the king, Anu as the rebel, and Nier as the witness who gets maimed. However, there are other versions which cast Anu as the witness to the rebel Padme defeating Nier as the king. I'm not really sure about this, as the rebel and the king are supposed to be indistinguishable, and Nier is very different from both Anu and Padme. At the creation of Mundus, we have Auriel being tricked by Locarn, who was aided by Magnus in his design to make Mundus. Magnus later leaves as he starts to lose his power. Here, Auriel is the king, Lorcan is the rebel, and Magnus is the maimed observer. At convention, where the gods decide Lorcan's fate, or the Elnafe wars that are its aftermath, Lorcan is defeated by Akatosh, who then becomes king of the gods in most pantheons, and then Lorcan's heart is ripped out by Trinomac. Here, Lorcan is the king, Akatosh is the rebel, and Trinomac the observer, who later gets maimed by being turned into Malakath by Boethia. To pick some examples from the games, the main quest of the Elder Scrolls 3 is the most obvious, with Dagoth Ur as the king, the Nereverine as the rebel, and Vivek literally telling us as he fills the role of observer in Sermon 11. Vivek then goes on to lose his godhood and either die or disappear. In the main quest of the Elder Scrolls 4, the champion of Cyrodiil helps Martin the Rebel defeat Merun's Dagon the King. They then go on to become Shia Gorath through a process called mantling, which I'll discuss in another cast. And note that when we meet Shia Gorath in the Elder Scrolls 5, his eyes are white. Like he's been blinded, perhaps? I don't think that the Skyrim main quest qualifies as an enantiomorph, because I don't think we have an observer in the fullest sense of the word. The closest that we do have to a solid candidate for this is Parthenax, who decides to help the last dragonborn defeat Alduin. However, I think that's a little closer to the simple granting of a boon in the sense used in Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. That said, I do think that the Enantiomorph can be a hero's journey of sorts. The role of the observer is key here. The hero's journey in some formulations has the hero being defeated by the villain in the first instance, which could be the king establishing their dominance in Enantiomorphic terms. We also have an outside agent granting a boon to the hero, which then helps them overcome their trial or enemy. In deciding to help the hero, this agent, the supernatural aid in Campbell's terms, sounds very like the observer, deciding to help the hero, or rebel, defeat the king, thus completing the enantiomorphic framework. So much for the enantiomorph as an archetype, but does it have any other significance in the Elder Scrolls? I think so, as where we do see it referenced explicitly, it's done as part of either a discussion of Anu and Padme, which involves the creation of the Arabis entirely, or in reference to Talos. We find this in the Skeleton Man's interview with the Denizens of Tamriel, which was an in-character interview published just before Morrowind's release. We have this line of text, which is part of talk about the new medium, to quote, 
The second to see the brass god was the Enantiomorph. You may know them individually as Zurin Arctus and Talos. The Oversoul was known to the world as Titus Septim. This passage treats Zurin and Talos as a merged dichotomy, which is in itself Tiber Septim. The Arcturian heresy also brings Wolfarth into the story too, which gives us lots of possible interactions between the three. The most usual arrangement that people talk about is with Chalti and Wolfarth as Ismir, Chalti and Zurin as Tiber, and Wolfarth and Zurin as the Underking, and all three of those then combine as Talos. There is a very neat picture that shows this in terms of a Venn diagram, which will be shown in the blog post. However, I'm not totally convinced that that's actually right. It looks very nice and neat, but we have this quote from the Heresy, which throws a spanner in the works a little. After he captures the Imperial throne, Septim finds the initial administration of a fully united Cyrodiil a time-consuming task. He sends the Underking to deal with Imperial expansion into Skyrim and High Rock. Ismir, mindful that it might seem as if Tiber Septim is in two places at once, works behind the scenes. So we clearly have Ismir associated with Tiber as well as Talos, so the truth isn't quite as neat as we might like. The reason that I've pulled out this particular example is because the Enantiomorph is key to the way that the three ascend. The Arcturian Heresy gives an account of how Wolfarth and possibly Zurin is betrayed by Hjalti Earlybeard. It's described in these words to quote, The Underking arrives and is ambushed by Imperial Guards. As he takes them on, Zurin Arctus uses a soul gem on him. With his last breath, the Underking's heart rolls a hole through the battle mage's chest. In the end, everyone is dead, the Underking has reverted back to Ash, and Tiber Septim strolls in to take the soul gem. When the Elder Council arrives, he tells them about the second attempt on his life, this time by his trusted battle mage Zurin Arctus, who is attempting a coup. He has the dead guards celebrated as heroes, even the one who was blasted to ash. He warns Cyrodiil about the dangers within, but says he has a solution to the dangers without, the Mantella. This betrayal sounds very like the convention at the Adamantine Tower, where Lorcan's heart was ripped out. This was the use of the Enantiomorph as a way to achieve godhood through a process that the Elder Scrolls lore community have termed mantling, which I'll probably be discussing in a future podcast. For the purposes of this discussion, the key thing is that Tiber Septim used the basic structure of the Enantiomorph as part of a root godhood, and it's arguable he was only able to do this because the Enantiomorph is such a prevalent pattern within the Elder Scrolls. Or maybe it's something to do with stacking multiple enantiomorphs together, as gets implied with that Venn diagram. This also happens in the Tribunal's Apotheosis at the Battle of Red Mountain, which has several enantiomorphs in it. The murder of Nerevar is one, with the Tribunal as the thief, Nerevar as the king, and Nerevar's shield thane Alandro Sul as the witness, who is actually blinded in this case. The defeat of the Dwemer is potentially another one, with Vorin Dagoth as the observer who helps the rebel who defeats the King Dumak and then gets corrupted by the heart afterwards. Exactly who is the rebel here isn't really clear, but the key thing is that there are lots of enantiomorphs going on. The Reddit user Black Crossover Asp has written a fantastic piece which is linked in the blog post about how there are multiple enantiomorphs happening in a very similar way to the three enantiomorphs of Talos. You've got several individuals that are interacting in various ways and betraying each other, killing each other and resolving various conflicts, which is potentially another reason why the Battle of Red Mountain was such an important event in terms of of the mythic history of Tamriel. This pattern repeating over and over, replicating the core pattern of the universe, potentially allows it to be manipulated in the same way that knowing someone's true name allows the one who knows it to control that thing in lots of fantasy literature. We also have a very definite three becoming one at the end of the 36 lessons, so that may also have something to do with it. Sothasil, Vivek, and Almalexia being elements of Alm Sivi, while Halti, Zurin, and Wolfarth are all elements of Talos, but we don't know for sure here. I would, however, note that this is only potentially a form of apotheosis, not a confirmed method that we know everything about. When you hear it discussed in the community, it occasionally gets called soul stacking and that sort of thing. 
but we don't know a lot of concrete things about it. The Enantium Morph also gets mentioned in the love letter from the fifth era as a potential way to quote, reach the final subgradient of all AE, but we don't know exactly how or why. If we're going by the same forms of reference as in Skeleton Man's interview, the Enantium Morph could simply be a reference to Tyver Septim himself here, who was trying to transcend Mundus, which feels a little at odds with what we know about his character. He was quite grounded and very focused on what was going on in the real world rather than trying to go beyond. The Enantiomorph as a transcendent mythical thing links with several sets of threes that we see in real world religion and folklore. You've got the three in one of the Holy Trinity in Christianity, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, where the three become one in a similar way to Alm Sivi. You've also got the three Murti in Hinduism, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, which is the trinity of creation, maintenance and destruction as three different deities. You've got Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver and Shiva the destroyer. You've also got in various European folklore, the maiden, mother and crone as different aspects of life and the feminine archetype. The thing that differentiates these from the Enantiomorph, however, is that it's not a conflict as such, it's a logical progression or relationship. Uh, you can see this to an extent maybe in the Elder Scrolls with the Time God, if you look at Auriel, Akatosh and Alduin as the same being. They could be the beginning, middle and end of time, but that's not really an Enantiomorph. The Enantiomorph as a pattern plays in with these existing trinities quite well, so I did want to bring it up though. That said, we still don't know everything about the Enantiomorph. An awful lot of what's being put together is only implied in the games and not outright stated. I can only find the two references to the term within the whole of the series explicitly. Everything else is conjecture and being put together post hoc. So there's quite a bit of the Enantiomorph that we don't understand and thanks to the nature of the comments that we do have explaining it explicitly, it could evolve into something quite different as the series goes on. And that's about it for the Enantiomorph this time. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to listen. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and join the discussion at the Written and Uncertainty Discord. Next time, we'll be discussing one of the weirdest states of being in the Elder Scrolls, which some of the biggest examples of Enantiomorph manipulation have at least been aware of, if not actually having it. Next time, we ask, what is Chim and how does it work? Until then... This podcast remains a letter written in uncertainty. You've been listening to Written in Uncertainty, a podcast written and presented by Aramithius with some kind editorial help from Cyfree. The music for this podcast has been kindly provided by Jan Glimbotsky and Jeremy Sewell. You can find Jan's work on SoundCloud under Songs from the Lost Land, and Jeremy's Northern Diaries is available for purchase and on YouTube. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.